President Mark, fellow members, I've been asked to introduce Howard Broad as our speaker today. Um, I did what you're meant to do, and that is look into a person, um, what they've got on the internet and so on. So I went on to LinkedIn and learnt a bit more about Howard. I tried to contact him. I got a phone number off uh, Kerry. Uh, he wasn't able to see me, probably for security reasons. And, uh, and so I've, I've learnt what I've learnt um, from LinkedIn. I'm going to share it with you. He's currently the Deputy Chief Executive of Security Intelligence at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. He's been there since January 2014. Before that, he was a commissioner um, with the Transport Accident Investigation Commission um, during his time as a consultant from about April uh, 2012 through to December 2013. Before that, he was a commissioner of police uh, and he did that for five years. And before that, as I found out today, face to face, that for 36 years he was a, a police officer. So he's got a long track record and he obviously knows what he's talking about. One of my uh, favourite things about looking at his uh, LinkedIn profile is that he's the chair of the Tyler Youth Development Trust. If you want to know more about that, it's on, you'll find them on Tyler, tyla.org.nz. But very briefly, it's a youth development trust and they work within local communities in New Zealand to deliver tailor-made programs that help inspire at-risk youth to turn their lives around. So it's very much uh, of our ilk, if you like. I um, didn't have the pleasure of meeting him before today, so I reflected on Howard uh, being our uh, Commissioner, if you like, or De Deputy Chief Executive of Security and Intelligence. I loved his surname. I thought his surname conjured up intelligence, broad. I thought that was great. And I felt that his first name, to me, sounded very safe and secure. Well, blow me, blow me down if uh, he didn't share with me that the actual definition of Howard from Old English is defender of the village or high guard. So unlike my name, which conjures up terrorism, I thought he had a, I thought he had a great name uh, to play that role. And I just want to reassure Howard that I have been security cleared. Welcome, Howard. Thank you very much for those um, introductory remarks. It, um, it was only um, a year or so ago that I actually did the search on uh, what your name means and uh, found that out about myself. It had nothing to do with the whole time I was in the police. It was later. I can just share with you, uh, by way of uh, responding to those sort of introductory remarks, the uh, turn, your, turn your life around um, program in Auckland was actually started between uh, the Auckland City Rotary Club, a police officer and um, some uh, teachers in intermediate schools in and around Ponsonby uh, in Auckland and derived from the experience that one Rotarian had uh, in dealing with a young person that they were trying to help, uh, which didn't go well uh, and it was until, uh, he, he was worried about that until he he actually uh, reached into the life story of that young person and found out what a desperate background they had and resolved to do something about it. And so Rotary um, uh, came along on that journey. It's been going since 1996. Uh, it's a long way from being a police officer to what I'm doing now, and I thought that what um, I could do was just simply share with you a few perspectives about um, the national security system, because my role um, now is to coordinate that system. Um, this uh, um, does not mean that I know everything about national security uh, or you know, can uh, deeply understand some of the perils that exist in the world, but I do have a privileged place um, sitting at the middle of the system trying to make sense of our world and um, joining up the various attributes that New Zealand can bring to bear to do something about it. Um, this world does seem um, uncertain. I, as I look around the room, I can see some people here who are perhaps even uh, better placed than I am to, have, to pass a reflection on whether it's a, a better or worse world. Um, but it does seem to those of us in the, in the system at the moment there that the uncertainties are at a particular peak. Um, concepts uh, familiar to our way of life and to perhaps the last um, 50 years, 60, 70 years maybe of international relations seem to be under threat. Um, the threats to democracy, those who don't believe in uh, power for by the people, um, the, the um, uh, 
breakdown in some of the concepts around globalisation and free trade and attacks on the means by which we come together and resolve international disputes are quite worrying. Um, what we can also say is that the, the way that these conflicts are unfolding or could unfold are also changing. We used to think about conflicts through land, sea and air and now we have uh, conflicts that could take place in space or through the means of information technologies, cyber attacks and so on. We see the um, uh, what we thought had ended in terms of global superpower rivalry coming back with um, Russia uh, testing us in uh, the uh, um, foreign policy around Europe and in the Middle East, um, China in the, their activities in the South China Sea and um, of course the United States uh, being in a somewhat more unsettled state than we're used to um, in terms of also confronting uh, where they see their interests lie. The proliferated terrorist threat from breaking out from the Middle East, which is a different form of terrorism than we may have been used to in the past, that is an inspired uh, form of terrorism where um, young people, particularly around the world, are being coached and encouraged uh, to give their lives in support of a nihilistic um, ideology um, and take other people with them, which is very, very worrying. We used to sit out here in the South Pacific um, feeling quite protected by distance. Um, that uh, ideology and the um, uh, information technology channels that are available means that our distance um, doesn't provide all the protection that, um, that we once thought. Uh, meanwhile, back here um, in New Zealand, uh, national security to us also means um, you know, a protection from uh, the ravages of earthquakes, tsunamis, um, being um, as well placed as we can be in relation to uh, our economy, so um, biosecurity threats and so on. And also, uh, we bring within the definition of national security things like uh, a, a, an effective response to pandemics, um, which actually, when you sit and um, evaluate across our various risks, has the potential to cause the greatest harm uh, to us. Uh, we're one of these uh, really virulent viruses that lurk in the world uh, to break out into an international pandemic. Um, you, you can, and I have been accused actually in the past, recent past, of actually just sitting there and cataloguing the world's ill and saying, you know, it's, it, we're all going to hell, you know, that uh, these are all desperate things. But um, we do need to place this into some perspective. We actually do have an economy that's actually running extremely well uh, by some measures. And um, success comes from capturing the benefits of opportunities that are out there. Those of you who are, have been in business uh, will know, though, that matching that opportunity with prudent risk management is actually the way by which we assure ourselves of success. So the national security system, is, as I understand it, is therefore a means by which uh, we can bring as many bright minds as we possibly can to bear on the most um, serious of the risks that our country Faces. Now, so I'm from uh, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, we sit in the centre of a, um, a public sector system uh, with a mandate to um, ensure that we are focused on the right risks and to make sure that those capabilities of government, non-government and the wider private sector and the public are joined uh, to addressing our risks. As I've said, we um, define our risks uh, in an all-risks manner. Uh, so we, uh, we adopt similar decision-making processes, whether the issue is on what you might think as traditional security and intelligence type issues, as we do um, for um, hazards, earthquakes and tsunamis and so on. Um, we adopt, we, we do not in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet try and make decisions for others. Um, we insist that um, these issues are dealt with in the accountable way that government typically operates. 
So we meet our responsibilities to protect people and, uh, and ensure that our interests are promoted um, using the decision make authorities that are vested in ministers, uh, chief executives of government departments, public officials with special responsibilities, and that we insist that uh, this be done respecting civil liberties and upholding the rule of law. Um, that said, um, we also would like to think that our national security system decision making is one in which we delegate uh, decision making to the right level down in our system, whilst at the same time leaving coordination as high up the system as we can reasonably manage. Uh, another and a principle that we adhere to is also that we aim to maintain independent control of our decision making. Um, that is quite difficult uh, when you see all of the interrelationships that are that build between um, enterprises and uh, uh, issues management and our relations with foreign governments and so on. Maintaining the primacy of our own deci decision making is a challenge, but something that we aspire to do. So. The role of um, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, therefore, is to um, support a, uh, an arrangement in government. It's a committee structure uh, whereby we ensure that the various arms of government uh, come together around um, uh, these various issues. At the top of our architecture, if you like, is, uh, is the Cabinet. Uh, and at the 2014 election, you will have seen that in, that um, Prime Minister John Key established a permanent committee of Cabinet, the National Security Committee, to replace what in the past had been a very ad hoc approach to um, ministerial collective decision making around national security. Um, that was a very unusual election, as you will recall, and the Prime Minister at that time did made, uh, took several steps um, forward, I think, in respect of national security. He, he set up that committee. He, um, allocated the responsibilities for the intelligence agencies to another min minister uh, and uh, he also made a speech on national security which was something that prime ministers were not particularly known for in this space. In fact one former prime minister said to me that they did not think there had been a speech by a prime minister on national security in their lifetime. So um, small steps. Um, the, uh, the, the officials um, arrangements underneath the cabinet, the officials committee is a, a thing called ODESC, the Officials Domestic and External Security Coordination Committee. Now, I remember um, this uh, this committee, which is well known, there will be people around in the room here to, um, I imagine nodding to themselves and saying yes I've heard of that. Um, for some of you that you may not have heard of it and there's a reason for that and that was because it was a secret committee up until um, about five years ago. and. Uh, I, I have a, an experience myself when I was uh, the uh, Commissioner of Police of um, speaking on radio and uh, there had been a, um, a gang shooting in I think it was Wanganui and a child had been killed and this was the, the latest in a series of shootings and I was trying to impress on the public that we were taking this seriously so I said that um, of course I'm going to raise the issue of organised crime with ODESC uh, and, um, which was met with great um, uh, a blank face from the... Uh, the reporter who was interviewing me, and then two minutes later the phone went and it was the Chief Executive of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and saying, Dear boy, uh, we have never publicly avowed the existence of OVIS. <laughs> I could only say, well, we have now. Uh, uh, this, the committee's primary function is to make sure that we're addressing the right risks and to ensure that the um, arrangements that we have in place to address them are coherent. Uh, it, it, recently we established another um, sort of uh, critical friend committee for ODES, which was a group of people who are um, very experienced, knowledgeable, uh, with a background suitable to criticising uh, the decisions that, are, that a, a fully public sector committee might make about what is a risk and what is not. Uh, so we included people who were, um, who are um, leaders on public sector boards, uh, people involved in the science community and so on and they've been very useful in providing um, very objective um, feedback on what the public sector officials are thinking about risk. They also have a, a, a habit of um, taking into, into spaces where you're not particularly comfortable. For example, 
um, they are particularly keen to want to try and define risks outside of the national security space, which we officials are very reluctant to do because as soon as you start doing that and taking it up to ministers, it starts looking like you're actually describing some sort of political manifesto and um, that ministers would regard as entirely their business and I think they're right. But when, you're, when you've got advisors saying, but you should think about obesity and you should think about climate change and you should think about these other issues, we see those as being um, amplifiers of national security risks, but not necessarily risks in their own right. We'll stand to be tested with that judgment, I think, in the future. Um, though, so we have a set of risks. We have a risk register, um, which you would expect of us, and we have a means of allocating those risks um, uh, to groups of senior public officials, chief executives of government departments are formed up in either the hazard risk group or the security and intelligence group and they are um, respectively uh, required to focus on those, those risks. Now each, uh, the, the, there is in that allocation uh, the definition of uh, one of those chief executives as the lead official on any particular risk. So no surprises that biosecurity is a risk that's assigned to uh, the Ministry of Primary Industries and if you see now Myrtle Rust or previously any of the, the big, um, you know, uh, the fruit fly or whatever, the Ministry of Primary Industries is the agency that has the operational lead on that and um, uh, we test their uh, contingency planning for um, those, sorts of, um, those sorts of risks uh, and we support them when the risk uh, does um, eventually. Um, so what do we do with these risks? We, um, it's very, one of, the, one of the difficulties of these, uh, of national security risks is often a lot of them are low probability, high impact risks. So, you know, when you're thinking of um, a tsunami, and although we've had some experience of this, but a really big tsunami might be a one in 500 year event. Um, or an earthquake, a really big earthquake in some parts of the country, a one in 1,000 year event, they are low um, likelihood, high impact events. So trying to then assess, um, uh, you know, to try and compare those risks, which, which of these risks are the most important? Where therefore would you recommend that government should invest its uh, scarce resources well, we, what we've, what we've um, trialled is, a, is um, like an, a, a normal enterprise would do, of trying to focus on what is the most likely of the manifestations of that risk, and then what is the maximum credible event that we can foresee within a certain time period, and then try and estimate what the impact of those risks crystallising uh, would have on um, the, um, the assets that New Zealand um, has, you know, it's uh, built structures, it's um, uh, agricultural land, it's, um, it's reputation and so on, a broad set of assets. So this is uh, a means that we have of trying to build a really coherent um, assessment of risk. Now, we think as officials, this is a really good idea, but when we go and place this in front of ministers and we say, look, haven't we done well, we've got this very large set of risks, um, we're just wanting you to know that we've got them, that we've, uh, we understand them, and we find it very difficult to understand why they're not happy uh, with us doing things like that. And that is because in, their, in, the, in the view of a politician, um, the um, uh, acceptance of such a, uh, a group of risks is of course political accountability for having t done something about them. So, so we have to be very careful about not doing what I've just <coughs> said, and in fact, um, as officials making sure that we're very clear about what we think are the priorities and being very um, careful about what advice we provide to ministers about what to do about priority risks. Um, so uh, we, what the system then does is um, coordinate policy advice, it coordinates uh, the contingency planning, it co coordinates um, the development of capability, uh, and um, it runs exercises so we, for particular risks um, and using uh, the example of um, you know the biosecurity risk we've run frequently uh, both desktop and full um, implementation exercises to, to try and work out where there are gaps in our capability where there is a, a, a gaps in information and where the command and control systems don't work 
Uh, we do the same in things like uh, uh, counter-terrorism, we do it, uh, we have a particular risk for example that we fear boatloads of uh, young people coming across from, um, you know, as refugees from um, uh, parts of the world um, and uh, trying to um, foresee what administrative process we would need to implement to uh, manage a risk like that happening. So, so this is sort of like a strategic approach to risk management. We also have a system coming under the ODESC uh, mantle of responding when something does happen. So Kaikoura earthquake is an example, the Myrtle Rust, uh, rust um, outbreak is another. And that is where we, um, uh, the system kicks into gear, we, we, we um, believe that we've got good um, scanning mechanisms to try and determine when um, risks are emerging. Uh, we um, uh, identify when the lead agency is going into action. If greater government coordination is required, we bring in a watch group set of senior officials who can test what they're doing, if necessary, else escalate that to chief executives and then on to the cabinet. And so that is the arrangement that we have in place for national security coordination. It is the world in which I live. I buzz around in the middle of all of that, uh, trying to make sure that that is a system that works and that it works to keep uh, you and all of yours safe and secure. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, okay, first two were Peter and Helen. So, Peter? Oh, sorry. Peter, yep. Yeah. yeah, you're yeah, Peter. I yeah. just, uh, I, I wonder how the election of Donald Trump affects our ability to support something like Five Eyes when it seems to me the political support in New Zealand for something like that will diminish as time passes with the um, climate change approach, with the approach to NATO and the other policies that seem to be being made there. So I wonder if you have comments on that. I, I do. Um, so um, obviously um, where uh, the President's policies uh, differ from those that are held by the New Zealand Government, um, influenced strongly by uh, the, uh, you know, the, the culture and worldview that New Zealanders have, then we will distance ourselves uh, from what the President of the United States is doing. Now, I, I, I don't think I'm uh, adopting any new policy at all uh, by saying that. That is in fact how things have uh, been in the past. We've uh, got a reasonable track record of actually distancing ourselves from policies that other countries have that we don't agree with. And uh, we've um, you know, shouldered the consequences of that. What, so that's the first thing. I, don't, I think that New Zealand is, uh, has a really good reputation for actually just doing what we believe in. And if that means that, that, um, that uh, we've got to be more careful within um, an arrangement like the Five Eyes of, uh, of how we share information, of what events we get um, involved in, or what um, asks they might have of us, um, then we'll do that. Thank you. Helen? You have, as promised, set out for us the national security system and the way you combine impact and probability um, to determine priorities. Is there, <coughs> is there a risk that you're happy to talk about that is sitting up right up there at the top of the priorities when you run the system? What's the most important one? <laughs> <you're doing this? laughs> um, so the, the um, on the, I'll deal with them on both sides. I don't think it's uh, um, a great secret that we're obviously concerned about, um, you know, the um, seismic instability of New Zealand, and therefore, um, how well equipped are we to deal with another earthquake or a big um, tsunami that might come off the east coast of uh, New Zealand? So I'm, and uh, there are particular risks associated with that through, you know, that um, from the east coast of the northern South Island right up to the East Cape that we're really worried about and you'll see a lot of activity at local government and central government level um, responding to that. So I think there's a, uh, a real big issue there. Over on the, uh, the sort of security and intelligence side, we are doing quite a bit of work about um, foreign interference at the moment. Um, now, Foreign interference is uh, an umbrella term for things 
like espionage, which um, is something that I don't talk about too much, but when you look at um, you know, the allegations relating to the United States election and you see there a question about whether or not the um, activities of um, political parties were interfered with or whether in fact there was a disinformation campaign that was state-sponsored, then you do have to pay some attention to that and you, you, you worry about what you don't know. So, so people like me need to get worried about that and, um, uh, and try and figure out whether there's a real need. Counterterrorism, um, we've got a low, a low risk, by, uh, um, a, low, a low threat level that we periodically assure New Zealanders. Um, the problem with that is that's based on what we know. And I'm, my worry is that if we had an event or two or three events, that um, it would um, so seriously destabilise um, how we think about ourselves and uh, lead us to overreact uh, to uh, the risk that we have. Thank you, Howard. Um, modesty forbids Howard from mentioning that he's actually been awarded a Paul Harris Fellowship for his work with Tyler. So while today we don't have a second one to give you, um, Howard, what we do have is a bar of chocolate and a, uh, <laughs> and a complimentary pass uh, to uh, Zealandia. So on behalf of the club, if you would like to join me in thanking Howard for his presentation.